Hello and welcome to Eastside Lutheran Church for our fifth Sunday in Lent worship service. We thank you for joining us. A uh, special thanks to our, our faculty and staff who are with us today helping to lead the singing, uh, taking time away from their distance learning endeavors to help us. We really appreciate that. In this fifth Sunday in Lent, we're going to be focusing on the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Uh, a very joyful in the end kind of event and, and sometimes we think that Lent is all sorrow and, and, and somber but we, we do have this this moment of joy here in this fifth Sunday of Lent and we look forward to that today um, you have the ability to look at the worship service it should be linked to wherever you're finding this video uh, so I encourage you to follow along with that we're also hoping uh, this time to have words for the hymns up on the screen uh, that you're looking at, so you should be able to follow along there. Otherwise, the words are printed for you in your service folder. We're going to begin with our, our opening hymn today. It's hymn 434, Lord, You I Love With All My Heart.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, we confess, confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive forgiveness of sins and inherit eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. First lesson for our consideration today is found in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, reading from the 37th chapter. And today we're talking about how Jesus defeats death and brings life, and we certainly see that on Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the middle of a valley, which was full of bones. He had me pass through them and go all over among them. There were very many on the valley floor, and they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these dry bones live? I answered, Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I am about to make breath enter you so that you will live. I will attach tendons to you. I will put flesh back on you. I will cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling as the bones came together, one bone connecting to another. As I watched, tendons were attached to them. Then flesh grew over them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind that this is what the Lord God says. From the four winds come, O wind, and breathe into these slain, so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Breath entered them, and they came back to life. They stood on their feet, a very, very large army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They are saying, Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we have been completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them that this is what the Lord God says, My people, I am going to open your graves and raise you up from your graves and bring you back to the soil of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from my graves, O my people. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. I will settle you on your own land, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Our second lesson is found from Paul's letter to the Romans, reading from the 8th chapter. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his Spirit who is dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh to live in harmony with it. For if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. 
Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, so that you are afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we call out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel for this morning, for today, is found in the Gospel of John, reading from the 11th chapter. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus was deeply moved again as he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Take away the stone, he said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, because it has been four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out with his feet and hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus told them, Loose him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word for our consideration today is found in our Gospel, John chapter 11. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. She had every reason to ask the question. It seemed that she had done so many things right. When no one else was listening, she heard the words of this man from Nazareth. When no one else cared, she was hearing his message again and again about how the kingdom of heaven was drawing near. And now she began to believe exactly what he said. That the kingdom of heaven wasn't just drawing near, but in fact had come in this person, this man, Jesus of Nazareth. She became convinced that everything that he said was true. That he had come to be her savior. She believed every word he spoke. And so she had every reason to ask the question. When the upper crust of Jerusalem was missing the picture, she didn't. When no one else was there to support him, she was. She opened her home. She opened her heart. When everyone else was ready to abandon Jesus, she was there to stand by him. She had done so many things well. So Martha had every reason in the world to ask the question, why Jesus? 
Why me? Of all the people in the world, Jesus, why would you let this happen to me? You know, friends, every one of you who has gathered in your homes to watch this message has every reason to ask the same question today. Every reason. You're sitting in your homes in front of screens today because you believe the words of that man from Nazareth. You are here today when you could be sleeping in or making breakfast because you believe that the kingdom of God didn't just draw near, but in fact came in the person of Jesus. You sit here today to give praise to his name and support the work of his ministry because of one reason and one reason only. You believe every word that he said, right? You believe that he holds the world in the palm of his hand and that he's in charge of everything. And so, yes, you of all people have every reason to ask the question, why, Lord? When that blow comes your way that you weren't expecting, when the circumstances of life knock you off your feet. When life's challenges and hardships are seemingly more than you can bear, and everyone else seems to be getting off easy, you of all people, friends, have every reason to ask the question, why, Lord? Why me? I mean, you, you have my heart, you have my life, I trust you. Why would you let this happen to me? For, for Martha, it seems that the nightmare began when her brother got sick. He seemed to be getting sicker and sicker and not better as each day went along, no matter how well she and her sister Mary took care of him. Now, I wonder how long it was before they began to wonder if this was not just a, a mere sickness, but that it might actually kill him. But once that thought crept into their minds, they knew exactly what to do. They'd send it for Jesus. Because if they knew one thing about Jesus, sickness didn't stand a chance when Jesus was around. This was the guy who came and took care of sickness. Lame people can walk, blind people can see, deaf people can hear. This little sickness, it wasn't going to be any problem for Jesus. Let's just get Jesus here. So they sent a messenger to Jesus, and the message is simple, but you can feel the seriousness of the situation. The message said simply, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now they sent that message because they believed that knew, and knew that Jesus had the power to make a difference. They weren't just letting Jesus know that his friend Lazarus was sick, that he wasn't feeling well. Inherent in that message was a plea. Can you come, Lord? Can you come and heal? When Jesus heard that message, he spoke some words that would have immediately brought calm and comfort to those around him. Jesus said, this sickness is not going to result in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And all of the disciples who probably knew Mary and Martha and Lazarus very well immediately calmed down. All right, Lazarus is going to be fine. Jesus is going to make it all better. And then Jesus did something really, really odd. He did nothing. For two days, he did nothing. He stayed exactly where he was. Two more days while Mary and Martha sat by her brothers, their brother's bedside as he began, as he kept getting sicker and sicker until he finally stopped breathing and died. And I think we all can relate very well to what those sisters were going through. The weeping and the mourning and the funeral and the burial. And while they were likely surrounded by friends, 
That doesn't always help the herd inside, does it? Two days later, Jesus says to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And then the disciples gave one of those great responses that we find in the Bible. But whenever the Bible gives us a picture of the disciples uh, prior to Pentecost, they aren't the sharpest spiritual knives in the drawer. They weren't particularly spiritually bright before Pentecost. In fact, they often looked like that child who's stuck inside pushing on the pole door, right? They were like, Jesus, well, if he's sleeping, then he's going to be better. And so Jesus has to be completely blunt with them. He says, Lazarus is dead. Let's go. And the Bible paints an emotional picture as Jesus arrives in Bethany. There's weeping and there's mourning everywhere. Twice we're told in this section of John 11 that Jesus was, was deeply moved. But that really doesn't paint the full picture. The, the word that the, the Bible uses here describes a feeling of anger and indignation all mixed up with sympathy. Jesus was angry at the whole situation. He was angry, righteously angry, at what sin had done here. While at the same time, he was sympathetic for what the pain that had caused Mary and Martha. And then Martha finds out that Jesus is coming. And she rushes out to meet him. And the first words she says to him, do you remember them from our lesson earlier? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She had every reason to ask the question, why, Lord? Why weren't you here? Why, Lord, didn't you come? I, Lord, I saw you heal countless numbers of people all over the countryside. Why didn't you come to heal Lazarus, your friend? Remember that Jesus just wasn't their Savior. He was their friend. She had every reason to ask the question precisely because she believed in him. Precisely because she believed that he had the power to solve the problem. Precisely because she believed that he had all of the love in his heart for her and her brother. That's why she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I tell you what, I think you and I are a lot like Martha. But when trouble comes into our life, we ask that question, why? But we do so still with faith in God that we're talking to. That's what Martha was doing. She, she asks the question, why? But she asks it in faith, knowing that Jesus had the power to help power to fix the problem. And so she asked him why. And I think it's the same for you and me. We, we ask God why these things happen in our lives, but it's not because we don't believe in him. If we didn't believe in him, we wouldn't be talking to him in the first place. We ask the question knowing that he has a reason. And we've got every reason to ask those questions, and Jesus isn't afraid of the questions. He answered Martha right away. Your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. She was listening. She had been listening to everything that Jesus had said. But then Jesus says something else here. And it's almost as if he's saying, no, Martha, you, you don't quite understand it all yet. And he spoke words that were not only meant to bring comfort and hope to Martha, but to give us peace as well. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Martha, you know that I've raised people from the dead. I'm more than that. I don't just bring a resurrection. I am resurrection. I am life. I am the answer to everything where this world has failed. I am the one thing that can set this world right again. And if anyone believes in me, he will live even if he dies. Do you believe this? 
Martha says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Did you hear that? She got it all. At a time when the religious leaders in Jerusalem didn't believe a stitch about Jesus. At a time when the disciples were still stuck inside, pushing on the pole door, she got it all. She says, I believe that you are the one whom God anointed to solve this problem. I believe not only that, but that you are the Son of God who took on human flesh to be the Savior of the world. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. She believed it all. And armed with that faith, she took her Savior to the tomb, a place of death and defeat. But Jesus, the Lord of life, said, take away the stone. And Martha objected because death has an ugly face after four days. But Jesus would not be deterred. He was going to show everyone, and especially Martha, that she had every reason to ask the question. He was going to show these people once and for all that death was not the one in charge here. He was going to show these people once and for all that death can no longer hold on to the people of God. And so Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come out. And a dead man walked. A man who had been buried for four days stood up and lived. A man who had been wrapped in the clothes of death and the grave was slowly unwrapped and given back to his family. Death came face to face with the Lord of life, and death ran away in defeat. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And Lazarus was walking and talking and living and breathing proof of it. Friends, we, we have every reason to ask the question, why, when trouble comes into our life and hardship is found in our heart and grief permeates our soul. We've got every reason to ask Jesus why, because we believe everything about him. We believe that he loves us more than anything, and that he is in charge of everything. And so we've got every reason to ask the question, why, Lord? Why would you let this happen to me? We've got every reason to ask the question. But let us be very, very careful about how we ask it. Because here's what the devil would like to do to you. He would love to have you ask that question, why, as you walk away from Jesus. He would love to have you ask the question, why, as you walk away thinking about the raw deal that you got. He would love to have you ask the question, why, to Jesus, walking away thinking that this God is not worth it. He would love that. Friends, we have every reason to ask the question, and Jesus is not afraid of them, but let's ask it like Martha did, going to Jesus. She didn't take this question back to her home. She didn't take this question back to her heart. No, she took her question to Jesus, and he answered. He told her, why? Why did this happen, Martha? Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And as she stood there with her sister Mary, with her arms wrapped around her brother, she got it. She understood that even in this, God was given glory. Brothers and sisters, we have every reason to ask the question because we know the power and the love that Jesus has the power that was able to raise a dead man means that he's got the power to take whatever your problem is and find a way that you may glorify God through it. That you may glorify God through it. Not in spite of it. Not in opposition to it. But through it. 
I don't know when that's going to happen. Whether it's tomorrow, the next month, when you finally reach the glory of heaven, but God will do it. Yes, we have every reason to ask the question because we believe him. We believe him when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that Lazarus tomb wasn't the only empty one. Jesus' tomb was too. And tombs that are empty are no longer places of defeat, but of victory. Standing next to Lazarus' empty tomb after he walked out was now a place of joy and hope, a place of new life. When we stand next to Jesus' empty tomb, we will look around and stand like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and we'll be able to say, I get it. I understand now, Lord. I understand that you are the resurrection and the life. And that whoever believes in you will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in you will never perish. Amen. It's at this time that we would normally gather our offering here at East Side. Um, ministry is continuing and we definitely need uh, your offerings to continue to support the ministry here at Eastside. There are multiple ways for you to give, whether it's through the app or through our website. You can also mail in those checks to our office. Uh, so thank you for your support already and prayerfully consider how you can, can continue to support uh, Eastside during this time. Thank you. We join in the prayer of the church. Dear God, Heavenly Father, how great is your love for us. You willingly sent your beloved Son to a world of sinful rebels. The innocent one came to serve the guilty, but his own people rejected him, and his enemies tortured him and put him to death. Because you did not withhold your one and only Son, but let him take our guilt on himself to set us free, we praise your holy name. Dear Son of God, our brother, how great is your love for us. You allowed yourself to be condemned, so that we could be declared not guilty. Fill our hearts with the same self-sacrificing love that you showed us. You allowed no suffering, no fear, and no doubt to swerve you from your path to Calvary. Give us the same single-minded dedication and unshakable commitment as we daily take up our cross and follow you. Dear Holy Spirit, how great is your love for us. By word and sacrament, you have warmed and transformed our foolish and stubborn hearts, making us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus and receptive to his gospel of forgiveness. Hold his cross before our eyes, that we may dedicate our lives to him who died for us. Make us strong in the hour of temptation. Lead us to love and serve our neighbor as unselfishly as Christ did. Keep us in the true faith in unity with all faithful Christians, and grant us a blessed death. Hear us for Jesus' sake as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude our service by singing our closing hymn in 214, Jerusalem the Golden.